My name's Ken Olson, and I'm the assistant principal cellist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. My name is Robert Chen. I'm the concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. I'm Hilary Hahn, and I play the violin. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine. My name is Frank Almond. I'm a violinist. It's amazing to have this like 300-year-old thing that is sort of living and breathing still. The violin isn't a tool, it's like the voice box. It translates the physical motions and input that you give it into sound. This is a violin by Jean-Baptiste Fillon. It was made in Paris in 1865. This is a violin made by Antonio Stradivari in 1715. It has the name uh, Baron von der Leyden. I'm very, very lucky to be the recipient of the 1742 Guineri del Gesù known as the ex Bazzini ex Soldat. This is a Stradivarius cello made in 1727. I play on a violin made by Antonio Stradivari in 1715. It is nicknamed the Lipinski Stradivarius. The, well, it has a name, it's not a very sexy name. Technically, it's the ex bein comma fru. <laughs> this violin was made around the Civil War time, so it's not really that long ago, but it's middle-aged for an instrument. One of the interesting things about these instruments is that they're so even. You know, like the register down here. The lowest note on the violin is here, you know. You know, you can get into a 3,000 seat hall and it's, I mean, it's loud. <laughs> you know, and it's even. After I received this 1742 ex soldat to Guarneri del Jesu in 2002, the next step was to look for just the right bow. Now, bows don't inherently have sound, right? It's just a stick of wood with horsehair strung across it. But different bows bring out different qualities of sound from the same instrument. So I literally had to try hundreds of bows over many years to find just the perfect stick for this instrument. And you know, when I look at those years of my life, I always think, gosh, I had to date far fewer guys to find my husband. <laughs> It was much easier, you know, to find the right spells than the right bow. I think it has a great lower register and kind of a more buttery middle and upper register. It has a certain uh, sweetness of tone, but at the same time, it has this uh, power. One thing I really love about this violin is that somehow when I am playing on it, there is no, um, there's no hurdle in my mind that I have to jump. If I feel an emotion, if I feel an urge to like, push the bow down or get a certain articulation or anything, it happens. In the old days, a violinist used to be able to purchase their own instrument if they achieved a certain level of career success. And nowadays, no matter how um, your career is going, there's just no possible way that you could ever afford one of these instruments because unfortunately their price has risen through selling and reselling and reselling through the collector's market, almost like an object of art, except they're not just an object of art, right? They're a voice. The fact that these Old Italian instruments are so valuable monetarily. It's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it, it does preserve the instruments, um, but it also makes them unattainable for a lot of people. Students think that they have to get a hold of or borrow an instrument that they could never buy in order to become a great player, and it's just not true. You need to have a violin you trust, a violin you're comfortable with, and then 90% of what you hear, if not more, will be the player. Yes, it's a privilege to play on an instrument like that. It's a very special honor, but it's also a privilege to play on an instrument that is right for you 
it's a privilege to have access to an instrument that you love no matter where it's from, when it was made, or who made it. It's interesting when it comes to the value of a violin, sound is a distant fourth in terms of priorities. It's, you know, the name brand, you know, which maker is it and how valuable are they considered? There's the provenance, what history does it carry? Who owned or played it in the past? Was it involved in certain premieres, etc.? And then of course there's the condition. Has it had damage and things like that? And then how it actually sounds is a distant fourth. And so, you know, players will, if they're buying an instrument for themselves, of course, they'll often try to find an instrument that's not a name brand. <laughs> but sounds gorgeous so that all you're paying for is the sound. People wonder about valuations and why are these instruments so expensive and all that stuff. And one reason is that there's really nothing like them. I think if you're a violinist and you get a chance to play on these things once or twice in your life, it's great. But to, to have it loaned to me for you know years at a time, I always felt very fortunate and um, you know, it's almost like you don't even want to think about it. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> On the like rare occasions where I do play something else, it takes me a lot of work to feel like I can get used to it. After 15 years, I mean, it just it's like an, another limb. You know, like it's I I know it so well. I know it's quirky things. I know the greatest things and like how to kind of get around and maneuver that. You have these love affairs with these other instruments, but at the end of the day, you go back to what is really true and dear to yourself. I love to think about the adventures that this violin had before I was born and before I came into its life, hanging out, making music with Brahms and traveling all over. And of course, we've had so many adventures together. I, of course, was the first violinist to ever play Metallica on this instrument. And it's amazing to think, you know, what else it might do long after I'm gone.